thank um, you, Emily. Thank you, Shane, for your technical and logistical help. I feel a little bit like I've just been equipped to get in the space shuttle or something. <laughs> with. <clears throat> a poem. You wrote a lot last night. <laughs> a lot. Which is wonderful. I was struck by your courage of expression. I was struck by your genuine aspiration for healing and transformation. I was struck by your care for yourself and for others. I was struck by your pain, your discomfort, and your hope. Is this perfect wellness, this turning, this falling into sadness, heartbroken, out of control, lost in time and space? What a surprise, like a giant moon hanging in the night sky. But where has the Milky Way gone? Spinning, dizzy, and stunned, by the thickness of mystery, a dark night has entered my soul, or have I entered a dark night? Have I failed? Only if I believe in success, whispers the moonlight. Falling and tumbling into the new again, like Alice greeting Wonderland, old mind dying, new mind rising. My mother is up and moving in the cave of my heart with candlelight. She rocks my world in the canal of birth again. I fight to remember to surrender. Where is my protection in this great hour of vulnerability? Unsteady, unsure of how to ride the wind clumsy like a baby butterfly, new wings dancing between earth and sky, bathing in the sunlight of compassion that carries me through the darkness into the morning of a new breath. So this talk is not the talk I thought I'd be giving this morning. So any of you who have an aspiration to be a Dharma teacher, talk to me first. <laughs> it is a great practice of, in the language of Christianity, unceasing prayer. And in the Buddhist language, beginner's mind, constant openness. And uh, sitting uh, with your expressions, your heartfelt writings, <clears throat> it seems to me that I want to kind of go to the beginning of the Heart Sutra, you could say, is very simple and very complicated. They're the teachings. And then there are the realizations as a result of the teachings. And then there's, so what do I practice? This is often the question that comes up. So I want to start with practice. And then as we go through the west of the retreat, we will look more into the teachings and the realizations. But it's important to know that in contemplative life, whether it's Buddhism or Christianity or Sufism, practice precedes insight. Practice precedes teachings. The Buddha was not a philosopher. 
He was somebody sitting in the jungle, <laughs> learning to be with himself. And out of that practice of learning to be with oneself and the nature that surrounded him within and without, insights came, ahas came. And then eventually those ahas and insights were shared some people remembered them, some people wrote them down, and then we have teachings, et cetera, et cetera. But really, really remember <coughs> the core is practice. So there are five kinds of obstacles to our practice, and I really like, I'm really attracted to old language, and not just old Buddhist language, old language in any culture, religious tradition, archaeological dig. Uh, I woke up at three this morning wishing I had a chance to be in uh, Dung Wan, where they're still discovering manuscripts, where one of the first manuscripts of the Heart Sutra was discovered. So this talk is about the unshakable deliverance of the mind. And that's early Buddhist language for what is our goal? What are we trying to achieve through our practice? And our early teachers and masters and monks and lay people would say to us, what we're trying to achieve is a mind that is unshakable. But not just unshakable, but a mind that is also delivered. <laughs> delivered from what? From itself. So meditation has three aspects to it in one way of describing it. That is awareness of the mind. Now what's going on in my mind? What's coming up? And you know, remember mind doesn't mean intellect in what we're talking about. Mind means consciousness, which includes the energies of our heart, the dispositions of our hearts not just our thoughts. So this is one area of meditation. This is how most of us get introduced to meditation, is learning to be aware of what's going on in our minds. That's the foundation for what comes next. What comes next is the next level of meditation development, which is how to shape our minds. And that's kind of revolutionary to discover that what I'm aware of in my mind, in my heart's cave, not only is it impermanent, but I can intercede. I can change my mind. I can reshape the cave of my heart toward compassion toward kindness, and toward love. That's the second area of learning skillfulness in meditation practice. And of course, the last one, and these all enter our, of course, is <coughs> this unshakable deliverance, this solidity. This is confidence without ego. One of the early descriptions of Thich Nhat Hanh that I, is really incredible is someone asked, Ty was being introduced in San Francisco for a long, long time ago, and he said he's a combination, Thich Nhat Hanh is a combination of a cloud and a Mack truck. <laughs> and this is what we must be. This is unshakable deliverance of the mind. So people, people who, oh, Thich Nhat Hanh, he is so sweet, and he is sweet, but remember the Mack truck? <laughs> you don't go through what he's been through. And one of the reasons he's my teacher is I know what he's been through. I know it's not an intellectual exercise. And many of us here have walked with him in the jungles of Vietnam where people have died. 
and still every step peace that's unshakable deliverance of the mind and in order to get there another great phrase for practice is to what we want to do this week is develop powers you know we're like preoccupied with like superheroes and heroines which you know is fun very cool but we have super superpowers but somehow we just been conv convinced that no marvel has them <laughs> nintendo has them you know dc comics has them but uh we have superpowers too and our practice is to develop those powers so that we can serve compassionately in this world. And we develop these powers through conquering what's called the five hindrances. And I, I talked about these at the university in relationship to our racial issue. I now want to talk about these, but I didn't say how to practice with them. So now I want to go into how to practice with these. Not only when you're sitting on the cushion, but when you're not sitting on the cushion. As you go about your daily life, as you go through this retreat, as you take your precious steps on the earth. <clears throat> and through the languages conquering the five hindrances. That's the old language. Not being victim to our hindrances because there's a great secret of non-duality that my hindrances are the ingredients in the kitchen of my liberation no enemy because I am my hindrances <laughs> if I hate my hindrances I hate myself So this practice of conquering begins with every step. That's not at the end. In Buddhism, conquering is always the process, not the destination. And as we do this, the light of our own inherent wisdom reveals itself. And this is what the Heart Sutra is trying to teach us. We have inherent wisdom. We have the light of inherent wisdom in us. But our hindrances would make us think it's not there. Our hindrances are, Peggy and I used the, the early Chinese Buddhist term of the red dust clouding over. We used to live in Chiang Mai, Thailand. And part of the year, there's an inversion because of its location in the valley and surrounded by mountains and all the pollutants rise up and cover the city. Our lives are like that. But it's important to remember, um, those are just pollutants. They're not permanent. They come, they go. And so the practice with the five hindrances is to train us in releasing, grasping, clinging, and attachment. And how do we do this? We do this by, come by becoming more skillful with our attention. Now, if you look at all the mindfulness research and the books that are coming out, and there's a lot of things focused all around attention because it's measurable neurologically now, at least at some initial levels. And <clears throat> but in early Buddhism, the language is yoni so. Yoni so is wise attention. And ah yoni so 
is unwise attention. And our skillfulness in these two areas alone can transform our hearts and minds. And the five hindrances, sensory desire, and I want to say something about this because Westerners with our Protestant and Catholic backgrounds really confuse this. Sensory desire means what do our eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, and mind desire in any moment? But in the West, it's easy for us to go to the eighth grade and think this is all about sex, <laughs> puberty. Because I do say when we work with kids, Everybody's like doing great till puberty. <laughs> then things start falling apart. <laughs> Sensory desire. And it's not the desire that's the hindrance. It is the grasping. The clinging. And the attachment to. That desire is a normal experience of being a human being. So it's our relationship to our human experience that the Buddhist practice is about. It's not a negation of our human experience. The second hindrance is ill will, anger, quite popular right now. And the thing, about, the thing about anger is that it is so easy because of the way we're made as human beings. It is so easy to ignite. And its energy is so fast. It's like fire. And out of the hindrances, the Buddha says anger is the most dangerous because it can ignite and set fire before we know it even happened. And then it's out of control. I don't know if you've ever been in a fire or around a fire or had a little fire starting to turn into a, it's so out of control, so fast. <clears throat> There's a great sutra in our chant book, Palm Village chant book, on the five ways of putting an end to anger. And when you go through the Plum Village chant book and you read the five ways of putting an end to anger, please know that Thich Nhat Hanh didn't make that up. There are many other versions of the ways, five ways of putting an end to anger in the Buddhist tradition, and they're all very consistent. The language is a little different. I'm saying that practice is a core of the tradition itself. And that might be a sutra we want to read one morning. Here. It's a great sutra. And if you just took that, that practice, that sutra for the next year, it would change your life. Don't try to practice anything else. Just take that one. Ill will, wanting to do someone harm. On the news this morning, there was a report of uh, the place where Emmett Till, the 14-year-old young African-American man, was boy then, language, was uh, beat to death. And there's been a, a plaque there where this happened. And a, a film student from New York was is working on a film about that whole journey. And when he got there yesterday, it was riddled with bullet holes. And then he discovered every month since 1955, wherever that plaque was, it's been damaged. Bullet holes, torn down, backed over by a truck, pulled up and uprooted. I'm talking about ill will. 
And what I've discovered about ill will in myself and as I have experienced directed toward me, I discovered first, it really pisses me off. <laughs> but the more I practiced with that, the next level of that was sadness. I got to listen to an interview of one of the men who was in what's called the Negro Baseball Leagues. And, and he was being interviewed and someone was asking him what was difficult about that. And you know, he talked about the logistics, having to sleep on the bus where other people went in the hotel, et cetera. Not being able to eat with the, t you know, going to the restaurants where other people went. Having to go into the stadium after everybody else was already there. And uh, he said what was most difficult for him was the feeling of not being wanted. And so think of this. You've had this experience, this feeling of someone wishing you were somewhere else. And your own feeling of wishing you were somewhere else, <laughs> where you were not, where somebody was wishing you were not there. Now, this is described in early Buddhism as aspects of suffering. We can have these experiences, but our practice is to train ourselves not to be defined by these experiences, to honor them, recognize them, fully experience them, take them into ourselves and use that energy to transform ourselves and our world. Don't be intimidated by ill will. And one of the ways you learn not to be intimidated by ill will is by recognizing it in yourself. Right? Learn to hold your own anger. Your own, somebody used the word in one of the things you wrote to us last night, fury. Learn to honor that. Learn to respect that. And then learn to let it go. Not so easy. Not so easy. The third hindrance to an unshakable deliverance of the mind is sloth and torpor. And we, uh, Peggy and I were a long time ago in Costa Rica for vacation, and we were walking through the jungles. And it was just amazing manifestation of nature there. But we, came we were walking, and we came by a sloth. <laughs> and so, you know, we, same pathway. We come by the second day, and it's like, did it move? <laughs> Third day, you couldn't tell. But it was working hard. It was working hard to stay in place. It was moving just a little bit. In, uh, in trauma training, we talk about, you know, flight, fight, or freeze. And many of us are frozen. And I've had the experience of being frozen. I've had the experience of someone shooting at me and I didn't move. I didn't act. <laughs> my body was. And I've seen someone else about to be hurt. And I was frozen. And this was really early in my teenage years, and this is part of my motivation for practice. So that 
I can move beyond a frozen life. So I can engage in this world without fear. And by without fear, I mean with fear. So you can't have non-fear without fear. (laughs) Indifference, low energy, exhaustion, waking up spent, Restlessness and remorse, you, you wrote about all these things with your own language yesterday. Regret, and I don't mean the Frank Sinatra song. No regrets, I have a few. But then again, too few to mention. <laughs> that doesn't seem really real to me. <laughs> and then doubt which the Buddhist, Buddha considers the most dangerous hindrance of all. Doubt in our own capacity to be profoundly human. Doubt in our own basic goodness, the Tibetan tradition would remind us. Doubt in one another. So whatever we do in this world, especially at this moment going forward, we must do whatever we can if we find those who would suggest that we should doubt one another. We should have the response that the Wayne brothers used to have on one of their comedy shows, homie don't play that. (laughs) But there are people whose mission it is to convince me to doubt you, to doubt the goodness in you, to doubt the possibility of healing and transformation in you in me and among us. There are people who are dedicated to that. One of the things Martin Luther King used to say quietly (coughs) in meetings that I learned about was we must remember as as hard as we are working, as dedicated as we are, there are people equally dedicated to the opposite and working just as hard and they have more money. (laughs) But that didn't stop him. It didn't stop Thich Nhat Hanh when six members of the Youth for Social Service movement he started in Vietnam were assassinated. And they were assassinated because they helped anybody on any side of the war. They did not ask, which side are you on when you needed your wounds attended to? This is non-dualism in action. This is the Heart Sutra in practice. Now, how do you do this stuff? Working with the hindrances. One of the things I like about Buddhism, it has a formula for everything it teaches. So I'm kind of an analytic dude. So this always makes me happy. (laughs) So I know what to do and not do. So I'm going to, here's a, a great thing to notice. This is about wise attention and unwise attention. Remember that. Yoni so, a yoni so. And anywhere in Sanskrit language, you see if A, the word, the letter A is first, it means not. So here is the first thing to understand about our hindrances is how we feed them. A great quote from the Buddha, nothing can live without food. So the first part of the teaching on the hindrances is to understand how they are nourished, how they are fed, how they are cultivated. And I'll read the formula 
um, to you. I'll start, I'll just read the sloth and torpor one. There arises listlessness, lassitude, laziness, drowsiness, mental sluggishness, frequently giving, this is a no sentence, frequently giving wise attention to it. This is the nourishment of sloth and torpor that has not yet arisen and for the increase and strengthening of the sloth and torpor that has arisen. <clears throat> What's key here is this structure. There is this experience, there is this human experience of tiredness, laziness, exhaustion, mental dullness. But that's not the practice. Except this is the awareness. This is what I'm experiencing. The practice is to be aware of, do you frequently give attention to that? Do you frequently give unwise attention? Because frequently giving unwise attention to sloth and tupor or to anger or to any of the hindrances nourishes them makes them stronger and calls up whatever other reserve there is around that issue. So if the key is frequently giving unwise attention. It doesn't say not giving attention. It doesn't say not paying attention. It doesn't say denying your experience. It says frequently giving unwise attention. And what is unwise attention? Unwise attention is attention that is caught in grasping, clinging, and attachment. Unwise attention is the ground of identity making. Unwise attention is the attention of Miss Piggy. It's the attention where everything is about moi. And so I frequently remind myself that everything is about moi. That's unwise attention. Some of you are experiencing, well, all of us are experiencing upset, agitation, anger. Some of you talked about anger and grief and being overwhelmed as parents, as friends, as partners, as husbands and wives and lovers and friends. Part of the key to the practice here is to have our experiences, respect our experiences, recognize our experiences, but do not own our experiences. There's a Japanese master who had a great teaching, has a great teaching on grief. His son had died and his disciples found him one day in his hut crying. And they approached him and said, well, you're the master, how could you be crying? To which he said, you fool, my son died. And then he says, I am in here practicing so I can experience the grief. Not as my grief, but as the grief. Because when it shifts from my grief to the grief, I ground myself in the entire human experience. I don't have to own that pain. I participate in that pain. I recognize that pain. There's a great other language for this Peggy likes to use called same boat. 
And the more I read of what you wrote last night, I was thinking, same boat. Some of us are in the same boat with our suffering, with our pain, with our sorrow, with our feeling of being overwhelmed. So when these things, when you experience these things, <coughs> my anger, <coughs> don't own it. Anger is a physiological human response in the body, grounded in the preciousness of our nervous system. Gives us information, lets us know something's happening that is disconcerting. So I used to say to some people, you, did you miss the truck that just ran over your foot? So somehow and people got the idea in Buddhism, we don't experience what is human experience. <clears throat> and so we're like indifferent. These pictures of Bodhidharma, I have one from China I got over 40 years ago. And his face looks, people are like, he's so stern. That's not meant to communicate sternness. That face is meant to communicate someone who's discovered the unshakable deliverance of the mind. He's not trying to do a People magazine cover. It is a symbol to communicate what's possible for us. So whatever your hindrance is that you're working on, and I want to do a little exercise with you, so you get to pick one. And in the practice here, they call it choose your working ground. Choose the hindrance you, you need to work on right now in your life so that you can heal it and transform it. And let it, here's the flip, and let it heal and transform you. This is non-duality in practice. Let me read another one, and then I'll flip to denourishment. Let's see here. Anger is so popular, I won't do that one. A lot of you... A lot of you wrote about restlessness and remorse, to use the language that's here. Let me see, where'd you go? Sleepiness, no. Five threatening dangers. Ah, here we are, restlessness and remorse. Here's the formula again. There is a human experience happening. And in this case, the human experience happening is unrest of the mind. I watched the news the other night. Bad idea. <laughs> <coughs> but we have to practice with this world. So I didn't have to watch long. Before, I was like completely agitated. I woke up at 2 o'clock in the morning, really upset. And uh, there is unrest of the mind. That's a human experience. The question now is how do we practice with it? Do we feed it? Do we bring out miracle grow? Do we amplify it? Do we call up everybody else we know who's having this experience and give unwise attention to it? I mean, oh, woe is us. We are doomed. I'm not doomed. I'm a human being. I, birth and death, that's enough doom for me. Why would I worry about anything else? So here's this experience. So frequently giving unwise attention to it. And some of you wrote about this also. So what did I do? Click. I cut it off. And then when I got up the next morning, I decided, 
how to, I decided to nourish myself by doing something I haven't done before, and Peggy hasn't heard this. <coughs> we were staying at Les's house, so I took a walk that morning, and the neighbors next door had put up a Halloween decoration of a scarecrow that was really something. So I decided to meditate on the scarecrow and the energy and care that people put into creating that experience for children. And I discovered for adults. <laughs> and so I took a photo of it. I've never taken a photo of a scarecrow in my entire life. <laughs> what we give attention to changes things within us. That is the nourishment for the arising of restlessness and remorse. How do we feed our restlessness? How do we feed our regret? You need to know your menu because we all have them. You need to know your habits around this. Now let's go to denourishing. That's more interesting. In the sense that the practice is always two sided. So I'll stay with restlessness and remorse. So there is quietude of the mind. Ah, uh -huh. finding quietude, finding stillness of the mind, and frequently giving wise attention to it, feeding it, feeding serenity, feeding peace in ourselves, feeding stability in ourselves, samadhi in ourselves, feeding that. This is why I meditate every day because I don't have to meditate to have the hindrance come up <laughs> at all. But I meditate in order to train myself how to nourish, denourish the hindrance, to take the power away. So I'll just read the whole thing here. There is quietude of the mind, there's a human experience and frequently giving wise attention to it. That is the denourishing of the arising of restlessness and remorse that has not yet arisen and the increase in strengthening and de-strengthening of restlessness and remorse that might arise. What a remarkable understanding of practice. We have our everyday, ordinary human experiences. We do not run from them. We recognize them. Thich Nhat Hanh would like to say, well, hello there, anger. Hello there, restlessness. Hello there, regret. We don't push away. We receive. And after, as we receive, the next step is to make sure we do not give unwise attention to it. <clears throat> There's a movie that gives me a, a great image of this. It was called Little Shop of Horrors. Remember that plant, Seymour? <laughs> Feed me. There's something about that. I kind of feel like that as I watch the news. I can hear Seymour. <laughs> like, I'm upset. I have doubt in the future of all of humanity. Feed me. Make me larger. Make me stronger. And so we must practice in ourselves 
denourishment and know how to feed the best in us. It doesn't mean the unbest in us doesn't come up. That's not the issue. We must respect our whole range of human experience and treat it with respect and kindness. One more, and then I'll, I'll share with you some of the practical steps to do uh, this on all five. But I'll read one more formula just so you get a sense of, that was restless. Let me do doubt, since that's so popular also. There are things causing doubt. So my first question to you would be as a practitioner, do you know what those things are in your life that cause doubt in you? Do you know what the conditions are that cause doubt in you? Do you know what the language is that causes doubt in you? Do you know what the emotional experiences are and physical experiences are that cause doubt in you? Do you know what the relationships are that cause doubt in you? Because a lot of you also wrote about relationships. Actually, most people wrote about relationships. <laughs> and relationships are not easy. I discovered that when I was really young, when I was like unhappy with myself. Just being in relationship with myself is a lot of work which I always seem not to be quite good enough at. That's the training of being human. There are things causing doubt. We must all as practitioners know what those things are in our life at this moment. And frequently giving unwise attention to them, investing energy in them, Spending time with them will nourish the arising of more doubt. It will feed more doubt. <clears throat> and it will call up the doubt that hasn't even come up yet. The other images uh, just popped in my head was like Ghostbusters, like Pillsbury Doughboy. <laughs> doubt is like that. It's like starts getting bigger. And it starts engulfing everything until you're inside doubt and you cannot see anything outside of that. You cannot see the whole picture of your life. You cannot see the whole game. You cannot even remember that your heart is vast and wide. And to denourish doubt, there are things which are wholesome, nourishing, noble. Frequently give wise attention to them. What are those things in your life that are noble? <clears throat> wholesome. And wholesome doesn't mean Mary Poppins, people. Okay, and I don't have anything against Mary Poppins. <laughs> but my point is, it's easy to get too narrow here. We live on a farm now, which when I tell my sister, she'll like fate. <coughs> she doesn't know yet, but we, li <laughs> we live on a farm. And which means we mostly live with thousands of blackberries <laughs> and deer and the raccoon family I just met last week who were hiding out in our shed. I, f I saw them go through the yard and I followed them and they went to our shed and climbed up in the roof. So I went into the shed and I could see these little eyes <laughs> looking at me. 
And every eye was saying, are you going to hurt me? So we had a little chat. It's like, hey, guys, cool. Don't panic. Don't run. It's okay. So I went back the next day, kind of scientific method. I went back the next day to see what happened. No tests. Evaluate, blah, blah. So I went back the next day. They were still there. <laughs> they got the message, and the deer came back. Also, we, we, we told them, don't panic, don't run. We know deer season is coming. Hunting season is coming. And so they are finding yards where they will not be hunted. Like deer are smart enough to nourish themselves. They are smart enough to pay wise attention. Where should we be now? This is hunting season. We should not be here. We should be over here. Can we not do that for ourselves? Can we not do this for ourselves? And I just didn't write out the rest of this because it's the same. And if you want access to this whole thing, just let me know. There are several versions of the five hindrances and how to practice with them online. This comes from the Pali tradition and sutras and commentaries. Here are the things we must do to pay attention to practically. There's a long list. I'll just highlight some of these. Doesn't matter to me. You need a stretch? Or you're okay for 10 more minutes? You okay? Okay. So. If you are struggling, if you decide that your the language here is choose a working ground. So decide for yourself which one of these five hindrances is most up for you right now. And some of you already identified it in what you wrote. Okay. What's up for you? What, what, is, what is the working ground emerging from your heart and mind? Asking to be healed and transformed in terms of these five hindrances. It's mundane. Some of you even talked about, oh, should I get a car? Should I not get a car? What kind of car should I get? Life is mundane, people. Our practice is grounded in mundanity. That's an important decision. That's a valuable decision to consider in your life. How to work with your children, how to spend more time with your, with your children. What's enough time? What's too much time? Oh, yeah, and how about you? <laughs> how do you take care of yourself? in your job, in your family, in your partner. I mean, it's just no generation in human history has had so many opportunities for distraction and depletion of energy as ours. Learn how to meditate. So I wrote down the car thing because I always have this experience every time you think about getting a car and then you go to look at them and then but you don't want to get one, <laughs> not a new one, because you know the minute you drive it off the lot, something bad's going to happen to it. Some clown is going to scratch it in the parking lot. This is how to meditate on getting a new car. Yes, some clown is going to <laughs> scratch it in the parking lot. Or that clown may be you. <laughs> we had a friend like back through their own garage, right? I mean, so when, 
when you want something, this, I'm in the sensory realm, and when you want something, meditate on its imperfectibility. Literally visualize it. My grandmother used to tell me when I was like in junior high school, oh yeah, you may fall in love with that girl, but remember, in 60 years, she'll look like me. <laughs> <laughs> Don't get too excited. <laughs> Learn to be even in your mind and how you approach people and how you expect and condition and perceive. So there's all these great, in, in Buddhism, this is under the category of meditating on impure objects, but that's like way over the top for us Westerners, so I'm just making this really mundane, but it's the same thing. The other ancient practice, you can find this one in Blooming of the Lotus by Tai, is the charnel ground meditations, medi the meditations on the disintegration of the body. And going to the cemetery, which I've done, this is a great practice. <laughs> to go to the cemetery, take a nap. Walk around, read the gravestones. Look at the dates. And I was doing, doing this once, and I came against this gravestone with somebody, it was like Larry Ward. It's like, oh my God, I died already. <laughs> For I got somebody forgot to tell me. So this is a skill. Learn how to not be seduced by illusions of perfection of objects and relationships. Some of you are dealing with relationships. Some of you want relationships so bad. Uh, when I used to mar do weddings for people, which, to be honest, I'm more comfortable with funerals. Because <laughs> things are like really clear. Uh, I used to remind, and this is from my own experience, I used to remind young couples Okay, I know you love Henry now to no end, but in about nine to 18 months, you're going to wake up before him and look over there and go, ah! <laughs> it doesn't mean you shouldn't get married, but you should be prepared <laughs> for the human experience. And, and, you know, a lot of Buddhist teachings and the structure of monasteries and robes, all these things are trying to protect what we encounter with our eyes, our ears, our nose, our tongue, our body and mind. So pay attention to what you read in terms of what it does to you inside. Pay attention to what you see and how it impacts you inside. This is what guarding sense doors means. And there is nothing that doesn't impact us inside. That's the Buddha's profound insight about this. Moderation in eating is part of the practice to, to deal with all of these. And I don't mean you shouldn't enjoy food. Thich Nhat Hanh really enjoys food. Peggy and I and many of others, if we have been in all kinds of countries and places and menus with him at the table and he just smiles. <laughs> so is this good? Enjoy our life. This does not mean not to enjoy. It means to enjoy our life profoundly, but to enjoy it in ways that do not create suffering for other people. Or suffering for ourselves. Noble friendships. Noble friendships. And this is really important. This is very difficult in our Western 24 7. We know we have value because we work till we die culture. 
Do we even have time for noble friendships? Do we even have time to experience the fact that we are loved? Or to give love or to share love? However mundane that might be. Noble friendships. And noble friends are friends that have your back. Noble friends are friends that respect you for who you are. Noble friends are friends who have no agenda to fix you. Noble friends are friends who are intelligent, thoughtful, considerate. All the things your grandmother told you about going to, uh, to kindergarten. Be kind, be nice, <laughs> be respectful, speak kindly, listen deeply. And suitable conversations is a key practice in terms of conquering the five hindrances. Do you have conversations that actually help you become and be in touch with your own inter-inherent wisdom? Or do the conversations you have pull you away from your own inherent wisdom? Do the conversations you have to use an image from the New Testament, pull out a bushel and put it over your light and shut you down. Suitable conversations may be one of the most important practices available to us in our lives because it can happen in a small group. It doesn't need to be thousands and thousands of people. Margaret Mead used to say, only small groups change the world. It can be one other person, it can be just a couple of other people. What's important is the quality of the conversation and the energy and the images and the language and the metaphors it nourishes in you. And am I enli enlivened by this? Am I lifted up? Well, I, there's this great song that Josh Brobin made famous, but I like the original version of You Raise Me Up. This is what we must do with, for one another, with one another. This is the practice of our hour, to raise one another up. In goodness and in compassion. And our conversations can help facilitate that. Just a couple of more mundane things to practice. Okay, friendship, eating, conversation. Learning to practice true love. <clears throat> These are the meditations and contemplations on the Brahma Veras. The practice of loving kindness. That's a meditation. It's a contemplation. It isn't just a mantra. That's part of it. That's one piece of it. But you can actually go decide tomorrow I'm going to spend the whole day practicing loving kindness everywhere I look and every encounter I have. And then be in touch with your experience of doing that. It's not a one way street. What happens? I tried this with the elk the other day out in the yard. I was just walking by, doo de doo and it was just eating, doo de doo So I just started sending the energy of loving kindness from my heart toward that elk. It looked up, no big deal, doo de doo back to food. <laughs> <clears throat> Meditate on compassion, the same. It's not just what we do on the cushion. It's, we train ourselves on the cushion so we can go through and, you know, what would it mean to watch the news with a state of compassion? I have learned how to do that in the midst of my agitation. A friend of mine who's a professor wrote me 
I mentioned this last night, that he finally fell into compassion around our entire political process. You have to remember, we're children. We have missiles and bank accounts and skyscrapers, but in the scope of history, we're just coming out of daycare, people. <clears throat> and I know it's easy to get upset because we don't act like adults. We don't act very mature. And in some ways, we're not. But on the other hand, the wisdom of children is often just enough. If we can get beyond our hindrances. Look at some of the interviews people have been doing with children about the world <clears throat> and about economics and around the globe and about politics and listen to these kids. And every time I go through one of these or I get a chance to listen into one of these, I think, well, this is, <laughs> this is who we should elect. <laughs> I don't care if she's only eight. Because <laughs> the wisdom is there. It hasn't been destroyed yet. It hasn't been conditioned out of our children yet. So those of you who work with children, remember, the wisdom is already there. The wisdom of the entire Heart Sutra is already there. In the other Brahmaveras, Kanja. practice meditation. There's a practice of meditation I want to come back here and do sometime that actually opens us up to the experience of rapture. in deep joy. And actually in early Buddhism, one of the reasons it can be difficult to achieve concentration in meditation, actually concentration comes after joy. The happy mind is an easy mind to concentrate. The unhappy mind refuses to concentrate. Well, I can come back to the rest. We have a few more days. But choose for yourself, right? Think right now, which of these is your working ground? Sensory desire. And remember, sensory is eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, mind. That's a human experience. That's not what I'm asking you about. I'm asking you, where do you need to focus your practice on human ex with the human experience you're having? Uh, is it ill will, anger, fury? Is that the working ground you need to denourish? And the flip side, what do you need to nourish? Is it a feeling of indifference or sloth or being shut down or being frozen in time and space and not knowing what to do next with your life? Is that your working ground? Is it restlessness? Remorse? Things in the past that still haunt you? Because either by commission, omission, or some mission, <laughs> you did the wrong thing, you supported the wrong thing, you, you ignored somebody else's suffering where you could have made a difference. You caused some suffering. I remember the first time I ever became conscious of causing suffering. It was around Christmas. I was nine, ten years old, and our next door neighbor, Richard Robinson, had gotten a uh, toy for Christmas that was some kind of air, air gun and he and I were playing he was showing me showing this to me in the driveway and and I pulled the trigger and the handle caught his hand and so my first response remember the nervous system flight fight or freeze flight I saw this blood coming out of his hand 
I, it was just right next door. So I just walked through the backyard. And I went into my house and my mother said, what happened? And I s- explained what happened. And she says, OK, now you go back and take care of your friend and explain to his parents what happened and let them know we'll pay for any hospital cost. And so then I began to learn how to practice with regret. And we stayed friends forever. That's amazing. And doubt. Yeah, she's always doing this. So. <laughs> it's part of her function. In early vaudeville, you know, the hook that would. <laughs> but is doubt your working ground? Are you doubting yourself? Are you doubting the rest of us? Are you doubting your practice? Are you doubting the Buddha, the Dharma, the Sangha? As the path? Is that your working ground? We all have a working ground. And that's wonderful. Thank you.